welcome to episode four, is it, Tracy, of the podcast. Mm. I cannot believe that we're on podcast number four. Sarah Gorrell and Tracy Sean, we, we are talking about infidelity. We've been exploring ways of dealing with it. Tracy, of course, with her blog, it's very much of the opinion, leave a cheater, gain a life. I've left my own cheater. That's what brought us together. But we're delighted to welcome on to the podcast today someone who has many, many years of work as a therapist, um, helping people with their relationships. Andrew G. Marshall, 35 years of experience, Andrew. How did you get into this, this area, this line of work? Well, I think I was called to it, to be perfectly honest. But um Many, many, many years ago, when probably before you were born, I used to be a radio presenter and I did a program called Lifeline and I was the host of it. And the job of a host is to draw out people and also to summarise the advice from the experts. And little did I know that is actually about half the work of a therapist, drawing people out and summarising what has been done. And everybody said I was really good at it. And I thought, do you know, this is something that really interests me. And it was sort of a like arriving somewhere that unbeknown to me, I always should have been. And I think it's actually probably more than 35 years. I think we've almost got up to 40 years now. When I first started and people walked through the door, they were shocked that, number one, I was a man because relationships were something that only women talked about, despite the fact that men made up half of all marriages. <laughs> and the second thing was how young I was, because I was younger than all of my clients. You've given a lot of advice to people. Have you ever been cheated on yourself? Have you ever had to work out what to do in your own life when that happens to you, when you get that devastating blow? I would rather talk from my years of professional experience. I've, you know, I've had painful experiences myself. I know all about the pain of uh, of relationships when they go right and when they go wrong. But I really think that my expertise is not from my own personal experience, but it's from uh, 40 years of listening to other people and going really deep. You know, there have been times when I've worked with people for three, four years in this situation. Some of them, um, in the end, they decided that the relationship was over and others came out the other side with um, smiles on their faces. And in fact, even the people who um, separated felt that they separated in a better way. And I think that is really important because infidelity invites us to think deeply about our relationship and very deeply about ourselves. And if you do that, you're going to come out a winner, whatever happens, um, rather than thinking there's a good outcome and a bad outcome. I think the problem is when you close your eyes to all of this um, and try and pretend everything is okay, if you go deep, you will get the gold, so to speak. What is the gold? Because it's interesting. Last week, we talked about what people wish they'd done when they found out their partner had had an affair. And Tracy and I, and a lot of those that have got in touch with the podcast said, I wish I had gone straight away. I wish I hadn't danced around and played detective and watched someone channeling this dysfunction and watched someone abuse me and take my money and take my resources. Are there times that you think that actually there is no saving this relationship? It's time just to go. Well, I think the most important thing to do is not to be harsh on yourself, because it, what you did in a moment of crisis when you were full of shock, I think you have to be tender and kind to yourself. There's no right or wrong thing to do at that point. You just have to get through the absolute horror of it. So please don't beat yourself up for something you did in the past. Let's focus on what can be better today, I think is my message. But the goal is understanding yourself and understanding how relationships work better, actually becoming more in contact with the authentic self, you know, who you really are, rather than the role that you might have been playing previously. I understand that. But if, if you're sort of going through counselling and trying to save a relationship, and we will bring Tracy in on this, because, you know, she's obviously dealt with a lot of people who've had some terrible experiences. But while you're trying to find your authentic self, while you're sort of counselling and dealing with someone who has 
had an affair. What about the risks you put it, uh, yourself at? You know, things like health issues, STDs, you know, maybe potentially developing cervical cancer, con- contracting HIV as the infidelity continues there must be circumstances where the best thing you can do to protect yourself and your finances and your future and your life is just to go and i'm sure there are those cases but what you're trying to do is put together a one size fits all solution to infidelity each person is going to have a different relationship they can have a different task to do and i think if we try and take the very worst cases which you've just described and use from that something for everybody i think we're going to have a problem if we actually allow each person to do the journey they need to do i think there's gold to be found there but strict messages oh leave a cheater or stay with a cheater no you've actually got to find your path And there will be pain on every path. There's no pain-free path. But uh, there is a path that will actually help you learn and grow and either come out with a better relationship than you ever had before or knowing yourself better. You can't skip the grief and the pain. I wish there was a simple answer to it. Let's bring Tracy in on this. Of course, Tracy, you have heard from so many. When did you set your blog up? I mean, this has been, I found it when I was going through a a very difficult time when my husband had cheated. Mm -hmm. And there were so many people on there sharing very similar stories. And you've been hearing these for years and years and years now. So it's been 11 years I've been doing Chump Lady. So I just wanted to to jump in on, I actually agree with you, Andrew. I, I think that going through infidelity, you do get to know yourself better. It may not be a a journey you wanted, but you're definitely going to come out the other side and and learn something from it. Um, And they are really painful lessons. So I think we have common ground on that. In terms of an authentic self, I think it's interesting you use that word because people that Sarah and I were married to, and and there are literally millions of stories on my blog. I get millions of viewers or readers each each year, and it's been 11 years. It's a hell of a data set, (laughs) as I like to say we are dealing with people who are not authentic. Now, obviously to cheat and have a double life, you have to be inauthentic, but that's exactly the problem. And so you also said, we don't like to give one size fits all advice, but I I did spend some time watching your videos and reading your site and the advice you've given. And from my perspective, it sure looks like one size fits all in that it assumes reconciliation and it assumes that you want to have a dialogue and that you it's possible to have a dialogue with somebody who's just demonstrated that they are deceitful and that they're very manipulative and then to assume that they're going to lead with unvarnished honesty i think is um that doesn't represent any experience that i've had and certainly not of people on my my blog i'm sorry to hear about your experiences and they were so negative for you If you're going to be coming down my path, which is that uh, you fell in love with somebody and that there is something that is worth trying to save, it is a different path from the one that you're doing. So I did try reconciliation for a year, over a year. And I would say the majority, the vast majority of people on my blog all tried to reconcile. They paid for a fair proof your marriage programs, you know. Michelle Weiner and Mort Fertel. And I mean, there's a lot of them out there, marriage busters, things through their church. Most people, their first instinct is to want to save it. And they often do this a great personal peril to themselves between risking their health. This person continues to have sex and that, that, you know, they're not consenting to an open relationship. Let me give you some specific examples. You're saying these are horrible outcomes, but I'm telling you, these are very common stories. People discover cheating at their prenatal screenings when they're pregnant. That's how they find out that they've been cheated on. Straight men have a certain horror when they find out they've been chumped. The paternity tests are children. You know, you, you it's the theft of your reality. It's You have some costs with this person. And these people are make decisions that you wouldn't necessarily have made if you'd known that you were being cheated on. So they're not things that make a marriage stronger. They're devastating. I agree with you 100%. I'm not quite certain what the argument is about. Well, I'll give you a piece of advice that you have, which is that when trying to heal your marriage, that I call them chumps, people have been betrayed, should apologize to their cheaters for their their inadequacies, for the problems in their relationships. That to me assumes that you think that our inadequacies drive people to cheat on us. 
Um, you're quoting me completely and utterly out of context. Okay. From an article in the Daily Mail that yeah. uh, spends their whole time trying to make people angry and upset, okay. which is obviously what it's achieved with you. So you have one set of people. What you have to remember is infidelity raises from serial cheaters through to somebody who made a stupid mistake and they love their partner deeply and they both want to find a way back. I think most people love their partners deeply who've been betrayed. Yeah. And they want to find a way back, but they don't have anything to work with. Don't you want to listen to what I've got to say? I do. Please continue. So we've got a continuum which goes from horror to to something that is is um, more understandable. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with the horror end of it. Down at the other end, what I say when it comes to infidelity is we've got um, a problem plus poor communication plus... Um, uh, mm, sorry. My, I'm afraid my mind's gone a, a, a complete blank. Um, it's just, I suppose, let me start that again. I suppose what I'm finding incredibly difficult is I've come on here to, with an open heart, to discuss the work that I do um, with people who are different from the people you work with. And what you're doing is you're rounding on me where I've sat for, in, as I say, a long, a long period of time and have helped lots of couples find their way back to love. In that journey, if what happens is you want to look at your marriage, you have to look at the whole of it. You have to look at what your partner's done and the things that you personally regret. May I ask a question? Do you, do you think that you they're... don't want to listen to me? Do you, Tracy? Hey, can I? Can I just ask something? So, sure. so, so um, um, I, I don't I, know if I, I want I... to. I'm I'm really beginning to feel terribly attacked here. I just I just want to ask something because I'm quite intrigued by this. Do you think an affair can actually make a marriage stronger? Do you think that if someone's had an affair that it can get you? Because because you know we we've all been there that you get married and you find yourself slobbing around in your pajamas. And this is what I thought. You know maybe I could make more of an effort. Maybe we could, we could reconnect. And I and I read all this advice. It didn't work for me. He continued to have the affair and seemed to quite enjoy playing us off against one another. But are there circumstances, Andrew, where going through that makes people say, "I nearly lost this someone. I'm going to get them back. I'm going to win them back. And I will never have an affair." Again, the people who arrive at my door are people who both partners parties want to save the relationship at some level. Now, there are sometimes men, and it can also be women as well, who are still being deceptive. They do not last very long in the kind of in-depth therapy I'm talking about. So, Yes, there are people who realise they've made a big mistake and they want to make their marriage better. There are people who want to leave their marriage and they don't have the courage to actually say so. So that we have different subsets of people. So I'm not quite certain why you're so angry with me. I think you might be angry with the former partner. I'm not quite certain why it's being taken out on me and why when I try and explain what I do and how I work, I keep on getting interrupted. I don't think it's an anger at you, Andrew. I think that the whole idea is, and maybe you you agree with this, is that when someone has an affair and you look online, the whole narrative is that it's your fault, that it's savable, that you can rebuild your relationship. And that's the advice out there. And there is very little that says what makes somebody the kind of person that deals with a problem by having an affair in the first place. I know I have never cheated on anyone else, so I'm quite intrigued that even if everything's going wrong in a marriage, that person wouldn't just decide to sit down and have a discussion in the in the first place. And obviously you're someone with years of experience and, and you've you've kind of seen this played out over and over again. Nobody is responsible for their partner's cheating. So if you're getting that narrative from me, please strike it out. So why do some people have an affair? Well, it's nearly always due to something that is actually about the person who has been unfaithful. So the sort of things that I've discovered that people have been talking about is, for example, childhood abuse that happened to 
to them that has created a trauma with inside them that uh, they've actually tried to deal with through uh, gambling problems. And the problem with addictions is if you don't actually deal with them, you need to have bigger and bigger hits so that uh, part of the infidelity was associated with the trauma from their childhood. That would be one example of one of the reasons. So it's not as clear cut as these are bad people, leave them. Now, if that's how your partner is, that's fine. You don't need help from me. But if you do want to rebuild your relationship, you do need some help and some advice on it. And that's what my books do. I'm not trying to sell anybody expensive uh, systems. What I do is I have a book. If people want it, it's useful to them read it. In fact, I have three books. If people want to understand why somebody cheats, it's not a good question to ask your partner, but um, because often they're not going to actually have the real answer. They'll explain how I cheated. There they are. And, you know, I don't force people to come to my therapy. Sure. So what do you think distinguishes people who also have traumatic childhood experiences or addictions or challenges in their life who do not cheat on their partners? What, what distinguishes them? Because plenty of people have challenges in their life and they don't go on to abuse other people. Yes, I, I agree. But um, unfortunately, sometimes out of our wounds, we act out. You know, we, for example, we scream and shout at uh, people. I'm not saying this is what, but there are many, many ways of acting from your, and infidelity is one of them. So there are many reasons that uh, people cheat. And so why do some people not cheat? Um, that because I don't know, you tell me why they don't cheat. What I found interesting in my in my circumstances is my husband's own father had had an affair and left him when he was 10 years old. And it was his most painful moment in his life. It, he talked about it over and over again. He hated infidelity. And then he repeated that pattern and he did exactly the same thing to his own son, almost at the same age, and repeated a pattern that he'd spent his whole time telling me that he loathed. And I find that quite intriguing. And, and you possibly possibly see this where maybe something people have seen in their childhood that they think is wrong, but then they find themselves repeating the behavior of their their own parents. Exactly. This is the deeper stuff that I'm trying to get at, that um, if you haven't actually properly dealt with that material, then unfortunately, the nature of families is they keep on repeating the same patterns over and over again. So understanding this kind of material, let's imagine for a second, your husband was not trying to run away from his pain and uh, um, having an affair gives them the illusion that they're going to actually get away from their pain. It's just complete and utter rubbish, but it gives them the illusion. It's a bit like taking cocaine. Some people think it's going to make them feel better, but in the end, it's just going to make their life unmanageable, which is possibly what happened to your husband. But there are people who actually do at the point that you're, you were at in your relationship. There are people who actually say, hang on, I don't, that we're about to repeat that pattern. What can I do to stop that pattern? And if you're in that, if your partner would have been in that category and they came to see me, I would be the sort of person that would help them unlock that. But unfortunately, we live in a world that wants a quick solution. So they just go for the e, what seems at the time the easy option. So I can see, Tracy, you're getting really angry with me. No, I'm not. I'm not you're, you're projecting anger on me. I, I'm curious about this. Tell me about boundaries. The people who come to my site, they have been very understanding. They have gone to therapy about the person who's cheated on them, their foo issues and what made them. They, they've invested a lot. But nobody has talked to them about you are being harmed and you are within your rights to protect yourself. Well, in so if someone room, is abusing you, would would you not want to have boundaries around that behavior? Yeah, one of the first things we actually do in my room is discuss boundaries. And if somebody is feeling that their boundaries are being abused, then that is the main topic of the conversation. If the boundaries continue to be abused, um, then I would be stopping the couple counselling. I'd be going to individual counselling. I'm 
here to look after the relationship. And if the relationship isn't working to the point that you're describing, I would not be continuing to work with those couples as a pair. Because, you know, what I'm sitting there is working with the interaction in the room in front of me. My client is the relationship. And if there is no relationship, then I will probably be working to try and unpick that relationship. I might end up seeing one person um, individually. What generally tends to happen is the person who is acting out and being the cheater, they drop out of uh, the kind of therapy I do after three or four sessions, and I'm left working with the other person, helping them deal with their grief and helping them find a way of of putting in the kind of boundaries that you're talking about. Do you find at that point that actually, you know, that person, you can see that person doesn't want to do the work, that they'll potentially skip off into the sunset with whoever they've had the affair with, but actually maybe five, six years down the tie, uh, the line because they've tried to get that solution to their issues by finding love with somebody else they'll repeat that pattern of behavior because they haven't addressed the reasoning behind it yeah i see that all the time from time to time i have couples who come to see me who five ten years ago started as an affair and they actually have to do the work that they didn't do five ten years ago there is no easy answer there is no such thing in this world as true love that you're going to rush off and is going to be the solution to your problems so if anybody's listening to this and they think that um uh, having an affair is going to bring them any happiness they're living in a fool's paradise because you have to do the work you might not do it today but you're going to have to do it 10 years down the line or you're never going to do the work and you're going to end up alone grumpy and depressed do you feel that for both people on on both sides? Well, it depends who does. It depends if they do the work, because if the person who's been cheated on does the healing work, yes. Um, if they keep on running after somebody who has let them down on multiple occasions, what you have to help them do is look and understand why they're doing that, because nine times out of ten, you find if it's women that there are they have fathers who let them down over and over again. And you need to help them understand the patterns and to break the patterns. But if you do the work, you get the gold. If you don't, then you don't get the gold. So do you think we are unconsciously or at some level choosing cheaters, people who are going to let us down? No, I don't think that. Okay. I don't, not in any shape or form, because how can you know you know, often these are things that happen 20 years after you first met somebody. How can you possibly know what's going to happen in 20 years time? Sure. Well, th there are people who do think you attract abusers, so I'm glad you're not one of them. But of course uh, not. Well, <laughs> what I'm quite interested in, Tracy, is that you and I, we both we both did what, what Andrew mm -hmm. is, is talking about. Yeah. We tried. And I can look back now on that. And, and I did say last week that I'm, I wish I'd just left earlier and I wish I protected myself. But at least I feel like I can look back and you can as well. And we tried and we knew the relationship was unsavable. Do you think that it was worth I, I'm just wondering, it, was it worth going through the agony? At least we can move on in life knowing that that was a relationship that was dysfunctional and was not going to was not going to sure. happen. We can be happy with that decision. I think those are your values. Those are my values. You're not a quitter. You try. Um, you give it an honest go, but you're not dealing with an honest broker. And that would be a question I have for you, Andrew, is that how do you winkle out your deceptive partners? Because a lot of times in my experience and experience people who read my blog, they will come to therapy as the price of avoiding consequences, of avoiding a expensive divorce, and they'll play along. But they're not, they will just continue the double life. Well, I have had people who I know are still continuing to be unfaithful. Um, but actually, we never really ever start the work because they are not available for it. But do you call them out on that? Um, yeah, yes, in the sense that I will say, hmm, what will I say? I mean, that I mean, I don't know for one hundred percent. So uh, you know, these are my gut feelings, and I'm not calling them out because their partner is the one who's calling them out. Who's saying, I don't believe this, I don't believe that. So you know, I'm there holding the holding the reins. It's not my job to to be have a crystal ball there, but um, 
you earlier said that people who are, are not invested in the process that you know you ask the hard questions and they drop out pretty quickly so i'm kind of curious what those hard questions are well um we start that uh, I, I mean i'm thinking over 40 years i'm thinking of two sets of um two sets of people where the they were the the stuff was continuing and you know in both cases we finished after 3 months or something like that so we're not doing the long term not doing the long term work because over and over again all we're doing is that question of are you being truthful about this are you being truthful about that um so no work is actually done but there is a a sort of a better forum for talking about it in my office than screaming at each other outside my office. You sort of can hear the truth a little bit more, you know, when there isn't screaming and drama, um, and you hear the clarity of what's coming out over and over again. One of the things when people talk about, I wish I'd left sooner, and they're in your, say they're in your office, and they're spending those three months, you know, trying to winkle out the truth from this person who's been deceptive, or continues to be deceptive is that real harm is going on during that time. And um, often financial abuse, these people are moving money, um, you know, double lives cost money. And there's, there's theft of resources, there's the theft of your reality. You know, again, they're having their health risked. And if they had taken stronger measures is what they regret, you know, if they, you know, shut down the money or talked to a lawyer or filed for separation, they could still be in your office talking, but they would have had these very hard boundaries to protect themselves. And oftentimes, in the experience of myself and people who read my blog, is that they are discouraged from that kind of self-protecting behavior because they feel they have to be understanding and open and, and, and that that would be anger, that they would frighten their partner off by doing anything to assert themselves. There's a lot of shame around the experience. There's none of that in my room. Okay. You don't have to be open and understanding. You need to listen to them, but uh, you don't have to be open and understanding. No, you just well, have to have good communication. Okay. Well, generally good communication is is being open and understanding. But Well, um, I, I don't, I think you can be open to, and hear what somebody has said and you're trying to understand and if it doesn't make any sense to you you don't have to you don't have to be this forgiving open person no i you see what i'm trying to do at the very core of what i do is trying to help people communicate better because um it's it's going to um it's going to help you talk about what where you are and what you're going to do next because at the same time that you're talking about people who are doing in being financially unfaithful and still having sex, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. the vast majority of people are doing what would be much more minor deceptions, like they're sending the odd text to their previous lover, which is obviously wrong. But How do you know that? Because I have millions of stories that bear out my experience of these things. And but, but I think the problem is going to be, Tracy, that you and I have entirely different data subsets. You know, you have one subset, I have another subset, and we're not going to understand each other. Well, so for people there is, who there are is in... A common, can I, there, there is a common, um, I mean, looking at, at everything, there is, I wonder whether, Andrew, you are intrigued by the fact that the behaviour and the things people say and do, it's repeated over and over again. So Tracy talks about the I love you, I'm not in love with you. That's a common phrase that Here's a book. Kind of that someone that. That, 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 that will be having an affair. There's the pick me dance where you're trying to get your partner back and they're busy merrily sort of playing you off against one another. There's a lot of behavior that's quite common in all affair situations, isn't there? Or, or was I, you know, were we just unlucky and we had sort of terribly dysfunctional ones. I think what the problem is, is that there is no one size fits all. You're projecting onto me a whole load of stuff like, you know, I'm encouraging you to forgive them, to uh, put up with material. I'm not. What I'm open, uh, what I'm trying to do is improve communication. If people don't improve the communication, the therapy goes nowhere. Do you think that people who cheat have an insight problem? What do you mean by an insight? An problem? insight problem, that they, they have a communication problem. They, they lack insight into their own motivations and their behaviors. That if you yes. just explained it to them, if you just sat them in your office and they were on your sofa and, and you 
got them in your crosshairs and you said, okay, we're going to have a deep conversation about why you did this, that that's what they need. They, they need insight. They need, you know, come to Jesus penetrating discussion. Um, I'm not quite certain about come to Jesus. But well, it's um, an expression and not literally, it, but. Uh, it's one I don't know or understand. Well, it's a U.S. Ex- slang. Right. Um, people who are who are unfaithful generally know nothing about themselves. They have not listened to their feelings uh, or understood themselves for a very, very long time. Maybe from childhood they've been trained to please other people or sometimes just to please themselves. But they really don't actually know themselves and understand themselves. Yes, most definitely so. So if they don't understand themselves and they don't understand their motivations, how can they possibly promise not to do it again when they, oh, they, don't, uh, if some, they if, don't know? If somebody promises to do it, never to do it again, I would believe them about as much as I believe that a dog would never never scratch its back up backside again. Because you cannot, unless you do the work, unless you go down into what it was that actually, you know, the initial problem that actually caused you personally to go off down this, unless you sort out how to communicate better, unless you have the long night of the soul, you cannot promise that you're going to, you're not going to, to ever do it again. So I would never, ever believe somebody who just puts their hand on their heart and promises. It's a bit like asking an alcoholic to promise they're never going to have a drink again. Okay. And this is the problem, isn't it? Because you're dealing with people who have found the quick, easy fix out of a problem by trotting off and having an affair. So you're really having to deal with some very tricky situations where you're having to get people who've proved that they don't want to do the work to do the work. And that must be quite challenging a lot of the time, Andrew. I just wanted to interject on, on this issue is that in your videos, you talk about affair proofing your marriage, which to I... me sounds, can you affair proof a marriage? No, of course not. You can certainly make your marriage an awful lot better. Okay, well, I'm just using your words. You have an affair proof your marriage video. It's probably been marked like that way by the marketing people. But um, you know, the idea that you can affair proof your marriage is is something that, you know, I'm I'm not offering that as a as a as a, a cast iron guarantee, most definitely not. Time for a fact check. Most definitely, you can actually affair proof your relationship into the future, because actually what you've done is you've taken what I call the dead bodies in your relationship. One of the later stages is that you look deeper into your relationship than ever before. Every relationship has problems. That's from the video Infidelity from Discovery to Recovery in Seven Steps by Andrew G. Marshall by Bloomsbury Publishing. Just interesting, isn't it? Because you say you, you can't guarantee that they won't do it again. And I think that's what's so difficult is if you stay with someone who has proved themselves capable of a level of deceit, it's really, really difficult to get that trust back. And isn't trust fundamentally what you need when you are married to someone? Because there's so much that's built on it, you know, your home, your finances, the security of your children. And when you know that someone is prepared to risk all of that for a, for a, for the thrill of an affair it's really really difficult to to get back to where you were before you knew what they were capable of yes that's why it's long and hard work well and don't you have better things to do with your time i mean well is i think that's up for everybody to decide not for you to decide for them tracy i would could argue you're revictimizing people who you know need help and need to get away and need distance I mean, time spent wondering about your abuser's foo issues is time you could spend no contact and healing. Do you think infidelity is abuse? Yes. And you think that people should should be encouraged to stay in a relationship with someone who abused them? Um, I mean, it depends what we're, our definition of, of, of abuse is, whether we're talking abuse with a big A or a small A. You know, it's abusive to sh- shout and scream at people. If everybody left their partner who shouted and screamed at them, then I don't think that anybody would be left in relationships. So I think it's up to each person to come up with, to find what is right for them. You're dealing with the extreme end of infidelity. I'm dealing with the mild end of inf- infidelity from what you're describing. Can you explain that spectrum to me? What What does mild infidelity look like to you? Like a one night stand, a drunken one off? Like what, what would be mild infidelity comes into your practice? Well, I'm that um, I know people who um, I've 
I've had um, experience of um, of people who have disappeared and never, you know, they've left a note and they've never come back. I would think that would be at the end that you're talking about. You've given me lots of other examples that were at the at that end of it. Mm-hmm. Down the other end, we have um, we have a whole range of other material where people had uh, short affairs. Um, they might have had several short affairs um, that they are genuinely ashamed and actually realising the affair bubble bursting and realising what has actually happened has made them really determined to make amends for what they've done. That is what I'm talking about. How can people make amends? I often say sorry is as sorry does. And I think that there should, if I think people want to stay married, I think they should get a post up and protect themselves financially. I don't know if you have that in the UK. What does sorry look like to you? What is What does actual remorse look like to you? Well, actual remorse is doing the work of understanding and um, providing support for their partner, being willing to talk to them when they need to talk about the affair, going over the same questions again, and listening to them and taking their pain seriously. That's making amends. But you wouldn't sign on the dotted line. You wouldn't say something like, I'm not going to fight you on a divorce. I'll come up with a fair settlement. Here's a legal, you know, a document. You know, put some some heft behind that promise. Sorry, I'm not quite certain what the question is. Well, if you have an invested life with somebody, and let's say they've been deceiving you or having a long-term affair, or, you know, maybe let's say we're in the middle of the spectrum, but they want you, they can't promise, as you said, that they're ever going to cheat again. And so you get a post up, you get a, a ready-made divorce settle. You stay married, but in the case that they cheat again, you have uh, you have your settlement ready to go, your property settlement. That to me looks like sorry. I've never had somebody who've come, who's who's actually asked for that. But if you were seeing me, I would say, Tracy, tell me more about that. Why is that important to you? Um, and I would really be listening to you and hearing about all your pain. Um, then I it's would not ask about your... pain. It's about actual tangible things that people lose when they've been cheated on. Yeah, but behind that is pain. And I'm still feeling the pain as you're talking now. So I would be listening to your pain. I would then turn to your partner and say, what do you think about that? How are you feeling about this? Um, I think you're 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 putting me up as a straw dog that, you know, I'm the forgiving, allow them to do anything guy. No, and you're here to speak to in your own me. words. You are here to tell your story in your words. I think what I'm getting from you, Andrew, as well, is that actually when Tracy says leave a cheat again in life, in, in certain circumstances, you absolutely would agree with that sentiment. There are some relationships that are not savable. That, that exactly. People, I'm people not can be happier and they can have a better future on their own. Yes. And I'm saying a, sort of a, a same thing that you're saying is that sometimes actually having a, a discussion. I mean, what I say is don't make your mind up what you're going to do too soon. Wait until you've actually got all the information before you decide what you're going to do. How so, are you going to get that information? This person's lying to you. Well, I think you begin to get, you do get a huge amount of uh, information. I'm talking about not making your dis- your mind up in the first two weeks sort of kind of kind of thing. Some people make their mind up, I'm going to stay whatever, and other people say, I'm leaving. Well, I, the ones who are leaving, they don't need me. But, um, you know, I think you've got to get through the first three stages before you can make any kind of, uh, of decision. So the first stage is shock and disbelief. Um, in shock and disbelief, it's possibly not the best of times to make um, a decision. The next thing that comes is intense questioning. And only when you've done the intense questioning can you really begin to think about what you're going to do. Now, if you're finding you're not getting the answers and in any sensible sort of kind of way, then possibly that's going to be informing your decision. Are you ever shocked at this, the behaviour that people demonstrate or the way that they carry on? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time, so you must have seen some some appalling situations. Um, I think the answer to that is yes and no. I mean, that um, sometimes I'm horrified by how much people can hurt each other. Uh, other times I'm just bowled over by the depth of love that people have for each other. And I'm talking about all of my clients at this precise moment. So um, love has the potential 
to really wound us and hurt us. And it has the potential to be a most extraordinary and powerful emotion for good. Do you believe in trauma bonding? Yes. Do you think what you could be mistaking for love is somebody just trauma bond to somebody who's yeah. abusing them? Um, I think that can certainly happen. But once again, those are not the people that I'm working with. If there is a trauma bond, generally they start to they start to talk about it, and we begin to examine what it is and how they can bond in a more constructive kind of way. These are not necessarily infidelity people, but mm -hmm. I certainly have lots of um, couples where um, they realise that there is a shared bond of trauma. Yes, and often people who where there's infidelity, and sadly there can also be a, a trauma bond there as well. I'm just saying, could that be mistaken for potential or love or something you should stick yeah, with? This I mean, person I, is actually in a I, very I, twisted, vulnerable, controlled yeah, situation. Yeah, I think that happens a huge amount, yes. Do you think, Andrew, that the narrative does need to change a little bit? Because I'm thinking about some of the programmes I see on the television and – Affairs are kind of portrayed as quite a glamorous thing. So you've got the the frumpy person at home who's a bit dull, and then you've got the glamorous, you know, that there, there, there always seems to be this narrative where the person being cheated on is looked at the as, as the person that has almost caused the affair. And I'm not talking about that from, from you know, from the advice you give. I'm talking about that from, from what you see in films and on the television and in the media. Oh, I mean, if I could change one thing would be what I call the Disney version of life. That, you know, you you find the right partner, you fall in love, all your problems are solved and you go into the sunset together. Most definitely that causes a huge amount of trouble because people don't actually do the work of getting to know each other really deeply and properly. Um, I would certainly agree with you that um, infidelity is served up on television as uh, entertainment, to be perfectly honest. You do occasionally see the full reality of the fallout, um, but those tend to be in sort of crime, uh, crime uh, detective novel sort of kind of places, you know, Happy Valley kind of scenario that uh, Tracy won't know that, but uh, you will. That's oh, yeah. where that shows the reality of infidelity. Well, it's been it's been really really interesting talking to you. Of course, you know Tracy. I do think from what Andrew's saying, he's a lot of what you say. He recognizes. He endorses. I think we have some common ground, and in, in terms of open hearts and open minds, I I would say you're welcome on my site. There's a lot of stories, and um, you know about how therapy works and doesn't work for a lot of people. I created my site to be a corrective because everything when I went through it in 2006 assumed reconciliation and encouraged it and didn't say leaving is a valid choice and is this relationship acceptable to you? It is a valid choice. I think the reason why there is more on the rebuild your relationship because the people who think it's a valid choice have already done it and they're not on the internet. That's why the most of the you know, our work is entirely different. These are people, the people who come to see me are the people who both of them have actually walked willingly through the door. The ones who come unwillingly come once or twice and either both of the couple finish or I'm left with just the female partner. But in most cases, people are pleased that they've done the work because what they've actually They've been able to understand themselves. They've been able to understand the situation deeper and better. They've got some gold out of a terrible situation um, that their better communication techniques help them when it comes to being separate, separate partners with the separate parents dealing with the children, being able to communicate better is always helpful, even if you know, in fact, actually, if you're living in different houses, you need to be able to communicate even better than if you're arguing in the kitchen, because once you're arguing over text, it gets far more difficult. So generally, the people I see don't regret doing the doing the work. And I'm very sorry to hear that, um, that the experiences of for you, Tracy, was so negative. I had a great experience. I, I left him. I've been very happily married for 13 years to a wonderful man. So, Congratulations.
Thank you. And I think that's it, isn't it? You know, you, the other narrative is that, and I'm on my own. I've been happily a single parent, four children on my own for the last few years, and I'm very happy on my own. And that's the other thing. I think sometimes you need to learn that you can be happy without a partner to prop you up. That's that's another thing yeah, that you can help with. <laughs> That's a, a really valid outcome as well. There is no one size fits all. Each person has to find their own journey. Um, We're going to end on a note of agreement. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we got there in the end. We got there. Andrew, thank you so much for being. Thank you. How, how do people find find out more about you? Right. What I have is a podcast, which is called The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. We don't talk about infidelity that much, but we are talking about all the things that uh, you need on the journey. So things like how to communicate better. We're talking about things like shame, um, anger, and you know the learning from anger. So the deep stuff you need to do, I've done a program that's coming up soon on loneliness, for example, um, and how our society looks at that. So the deep psychological, spiritual work that uh, possibly needs to be done in the journey is sort of what I'm mainly about these days. I don't do so much of the um, specific infidelity work because what it opened up to me was just how deep you need to go to uh, recover from infidelity. You really need to look deep into your soul and understand yourself. And so that's what I'm much more interested in these days. But I also have a book which is called How Can I Ever Trust You Again? And if you're interested in understanding the mind of a cheater, then you can look at my book, Why Did I Cheat?, which is addressed to people who are unfaithful if they do want to do the work. Um, and you can understand a little bit what's happening that way. And I have a website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. Sounds like you're very busy and it's been, thank you for sparing us the time. It's been great to have you with us. If you have any comments for us or want to leave us a message, come to chumplady.com forward slash mighty. And we'd love to hear from you. Talk to you next week.